hello everyone welcome back to lecture 20 so far we have uh, looked at the different type of uh, adsorbates on surface like atomic adsorbates uh, small molecular adsorbates and even larger molecular adsorbates we have already checked and also while we were looking at the adsorbates on surface we have also uh, tried to 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 look at using uh, a scanning uh, tunneling microscopy so mainly using microscopy we were basically kind of understanding the microscopic structure or the arrangement of atoms and molecules and so on on the surfaces of course we have not looked carefully into the details of that microscopy itself because uh, you have already seen that at every uh, point of our discussion we were using a scanning tunneling micrograph uh, scanning tunneling microscopy images to understand really the microscopic and molecular level structure of the adsorbate on surface. So it is clear that you are convinced that we need to actually understand this microscopic technique in greater detail. So that is what we are going to do in the next um, uh, four to five lectures. We will try to understand basically what is scanning tunneling microscopy and what are its additional applications. Um, uh, than what we have already seen uh, in the previous um, uh, lectures. Yeah? So scanning tunneling microscopy is basically the topic that I am going to cover uh, in couple of uh, next lectures and the scanning tunneling microscope comes under a broad class of microscopy known as scanning probe microscopy. So I will come to that in a minute uh, and today's lecture we will be looking a little bit more into the details of scanning tunneling microscopy. Yeah? Um, so, what is uh, scanning probe microscopy? So, that is something what we will uh, first look. So, probe is generally uh, something that you can use uh, to investigate something. So, that is what a probe means. Uh, you might also have noticed that um, people who are having like you know uh, vision uh, problems, they usually carry uh, a stick that is known as a probe and they normally what they do is they carry that probe or the stick uh, uh, to identify the obstacle. So, they move across and as soon as they find obstacle, they would just basically move the probe over that. So, that is kind of identifying or probing the, the surface along which they are walking. Yeah? So, the same idea is also what we use here in, in generally surface or scanning probe microscopy. That is the general classification SPM uh, it is known as. Uh, what we do is instead of using a, a big probe, we are basically using something known as an atomically sharp tip. Yeah? So probe, this is also an atomically sharp tip. So the tip can of course be made up of different type of material depending on what you want to probe. So that is the most important thing that you keep it in mind. So what you have is always a probe, but the probe is actually capable of scan along the X y and also along the z direction that is the key point so you can basically just access all the three different axes while we are using this probe and now you take a surface bring the probe or the tip on top of the surface and scan across the surface and probe what is on the surface so that is exactly what a scanning probe microscope does but the interesting thing is that unlike other microscope like optical microscope or electron microscope, there you are basically investigating things from a further distance, but in this case your probe is at a very, very close proximity of the surface. That means in the order of a few nanometer away from the surface is where you basically have the tip investigating the uh, topography or the, the nature of the surface itself. And that is why it is generally known as a near field microscopy, uh, near field microscope. So, because you are actually just looking things in a, in a close proximity. And of course, the image that you obtain is not a direct image. It is basically some kind of an information that you extract from the surface and then this is basically then converted to an image. So, that is what basically you do. Now, let us look at the possible interaction that you can lead to, to an image on the surface. So, these are something what makes the different type of probe microscopes. As you see here, scanning tunneling microscope, generally known as STM, uh, 
in that you measure something like tunneling current between the surface and the tip. Yeah, so to measure of course current you need to definitely apply a bias between the tip and the sample. Sample tip you apply a bias between them and in the very very cross proximity if you move the tip then you can actually measure something called a tunneling current. So we will look into that in greater detail because it is quite important for us to understand the tunneling current. Uh, so if you measure tunneling current then it is generally known as scanning tunneling microscope. So you are ideally measuring the tunneling current across the surface and then you are probing the surface as a function of tunneling current and the x, y plane. So that is what you do. Now if you are measuring something like atomic forces that is acting between the surface and the tip, then you have something known as atomic force microscope. Yeah? Then you can measure many different other forces like electrical force, magnetic force, then you have actually electrical force microscopy or magnetic force microscopy generally known as EFM, MFM and so on which is another type of atomic force microscopy but where you are actually just looking at the electrical force that is acting between the tip and the sample. In atomic force uh, microscopy the only difference is that tip is not uh, uh, just uh, floating like that it is basically just kept on something known as a cantilever we will definitely uh, have several classes on atomic force microscopy towards the end of the lecture. So, we will look into that in detail, but just to be uh, aware at this point of time that uh, in the case of atomic force microscope, the tip is always placed on a cantilever. Yeah? So, that is the, the slight difference between that. Then one can also measure uh, electrochemical potential that is actually just acting between the tip and the surface or you can measure thermal properties or temperature difference between the tip and the sample. You can also measure optical properties. There are many, many things that you can actually measure uh, from the surface using a tip, but the design of the tip is definitely going to be different depending on what you are going to measure. Uh, therefore, each of them is in itself is an interesting topic to, to understand and to, to study, for example. But in, in our context, we are only going to deal with the scanning tunneling microscope and atomic force microscope because these are microscope that can reach a resolution of um, atoms. You can basically see atoms. You have already seen in some of the images in the previous classes, we can really see atoms on surfaces. So therefore, we would be looking only at these microscope in our, context, co in our context and therefore, I will be basically just discussing with you the tunneling microscopy and the atomic force microscopy in greater detail. Yeah? So let me then start with the tunneling microscope first and then to after we have a look at uh, several examples and the use of scanning tunneling microscopy, then we will basically look at the atomic force microscope in greater detail. Good. So, what do we have in scanning tunneling microscope? Yeah. So, I would basically like to investigate a surface of this type where I have a, a surface lattice. So, you can see the blue atoms are nothing but my surface lattice and then I have added an add atom on top of the surface. So, you by now you know what is an add atom. Yeah? It is actually the atom or the adsorbate atom that you have deposited and I have an atom which is sticking on top of the surface. Now, I want to investigate this surface basically. Yeah? So, this is of course a schematic picture and I want to basically investigate and get the atomic resolution of the atom on the surface so that you can basically understand where the atom is exactly sitting on the surface. So, this is what our task is. So, how do we do that in scanning tunneling microscope? Well, the most important requirement in scanning tunneling microscopy is to have a tip, but not just any type of tip. You need to have a tip which is atomically sharp. So, that is the most important requirement. Yeah. So, you might be wondering at this stage how can we make an atomically sharp tip. So, I will just give you the tips later um, during the lecture. But of course, believe me that you can make atomically sharp tip and that is the most important requirement to achieve atomic resolution on surface. You will actually be convinced when we look into the working principle of scanning tunneling microscope. Now, the interesting thing is that you need to bring the tip in a, in a very close proximity to surface in the order of a nanometer or two nanometer something like that. And now, you need to also apply a bias between the tip and the sample. 
that also means the tip and the sample should be conducting in nature yeah semiconductor metal or of course you would also find thin films on metal can also be investigated uh, and that's actually the the one of the biggest drawback in scanning tunneling microscope as you will see that we are limited to use semiconducting or conducting sample or ultra thin films of insulator so this is all what we can basically do with scanning tunneling microscope but don't worry it is ex quite exciting nonetheless you can investigate quite a lot of interesting aspects using scanning tunneling microscopy so that's the most important thing so now i apply a bias between the tip and the sample now once you apply the bias between the sample and the tip there will be a current that is passing between the tip and the sample which is strongly dependent on the distance between the tip and the sample yeah but not just uh, uh, in a very simple manner it is actually dependent in exponential manner with respect to the uh, distance and then you also have a dependency of something known as uh, uh, average barrier height or the barrier height you will see in the next slides what is this barrier meaning it is actually some kind of a potential barrier that limits the electrons to go through because as you see directly in the image there is some kind of a vacuum that is between the tip and the sample they are not connected yeah so that's the interesting thing they are not connected but there is some kind of a gap in between and i am assuming that all this thing is actually happening in kind of a vacuum space uh, which is meaning that there is no medium which is actually in meaning that there is some kind of a barrier there is a potential barrier that limits the electrons to pass from the tip to the surface well that is what the tunneling itself means it is actually um, a, a quantum mechanical phenomena we will see in the next slide but what is important at this point of time to notice is that this tunneling current is strongly dependent on the distance yeah so that means if you would have plotted basically the current versus um, distance current versus distance then it would have looked like this kind of an exponential function right so you directly see that if i would make a small change in z yeah so if i would make a small change in z so that means dz then you can see that there is a much stronger change in the current that's what is interesting about the exponential function itself so the delta i corresponding so that's what i have actually just written here so the change in current um, as a function of distance is much 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 stronger yeah now let's see the interesting aspect so now the uh, tip is basically just placed on top of an atom so assume that you are actually just having your tip exactly placed on top of an atom then the average distance between the tip and the surface is basically smaller compared to you move the tip to a position which is in between the atom so you naturally see that here the z is uh, larger so in a way i want to say is basically that z prime is greater than z yeah so the position z prime is basically representing that the tip is in fact in between two atoms where the distance between the tip and the sample is higher so what is the consequence the consequence is that there will be a drop in current of about one order of magnitude yeah so if one angstrom uh, uh, distance changes then there is uh, an order of magnitude change in the current happens so therefore what you would expect is that when you move the tip for example across the atomic lattice so now you scan the uh, um, tip across the atomic lattice you would find that you can measure basically a high current here a low current here so ideally this small difference that delta i is nothing but representing some kind of a change in tunneling current as a function of distance yeah this is nice what do you see in the line profile the current line profile is that you basically see that there is a kind of nice profile that you have created which is exactly replicating the atomic lattice that means you have resolved the atoms this is exactly the principle at which the STM works. Now you can do the scanning. So you have actually now moved the uh, 
uh, a tip along one line. So now you can basically move the tip to a next line, scan, move to another line scan and you can basically just make many, many, many line scans. And as soon as your tip basically reach on top of the uh, add atom, you would directly find that there will be a strong change in the distance because the tip will actually just be mating the atom in a very, very close proximity. There is a strong change in the current and that would mean the position where the add atom is sitting will look much brighter in the image. Yeah? So therefore, you can identify the atom uh, itself on the surface. So now, let us look at an image. So what you are going to basically see is the sum of many, many, many line scans and you do across the x, y plane. And when you do that, you basically get something like this, where each of these bright regions are corresponding to the, uh, uh, to the surface atoms and this is basically the add atom that you have deposited on the surface. So ni nicely, you can resolve the uh, atoms in a, in a beautiful way and you can get the atomic resolution on surface. So this is quite um, interesting. So it is uh, unimportant at the context what is the type of uh, material that you are using because also later you would find that uh, it is hard to get something like a material um, related contrast in STM. But nonetheless, what you would be looking at is something called an electron density of the surface, uh, but with that you can kind of recognize what is the uh, different positions of atoms of the surface or what if you put actually add atoms on the surface and so on. Yeah? So we look at uh, several examples now onwards and then you would basically just uh, can understand this uh, a little bit more better. Good, um, who invented scanning tunneling microscopy? So that's uh, the most important part. So actually it was invented by Gerd Binning and uh, Heinrich Rohrer. So they are basically just uh, colleagues working in the IBM research division. And they've invented um, uh, the, the microscope itself about uh, 1980. So 1979 to 1980, so they have actually invented. And you can see they have got the Nobel Prize awarded within just five years. This is actually one of the discovery for which the Nobel Prize was awarded almost immediately after the discovery. So you will actually just see that how powerful this technique or how powerful this technique became um, that people recognize within five years that this is going to be one of the most important tool in nanotechnology itself. You will see that uh, in, in my upcoming lectures that we will use scanning tunneling microscopy to do and understand a lot of interesting things that you will also find at some point this is not just some tool to image, but this is also a tool for doing things on surface. So that's the interesting aspect about it. Yeah, But I just want to also recollect a story at this point that in 1986, when they got the Nobel Prize uh, in physics for the discovery of microscopy, there was also another person who actually just got um, the Nobel Prize in physics, which was also for microscopy, in fact, that was for electron microscopy, and that was actually given to Ernst Ruska. Yeah? But the interesting thing, what I want to tell here or recollect here, he actually invented the electron microscope in 1933 but he got the Nobel Prize after 53 years. Yeah? Normally, you know that Nobel Prizes are actually coming after quite a lot of waiting, but the discovery itself was kind of recognized immediately after five years because this is actually one of the most important discovery where people could first time ever realize, see atoms in real space. Yeah, and also, uh, some of the most unsettled questions were answered immediately because seeing is believing. So if you have a photograph, you believe that. Yeah, This is the point. So here you have images of the surface, so you will believe it. So that's the uh, most important exciting part about it. So now I'll show you uh, one of the most important discoveries uh, that actually just uh, triggered during this time. You can see the publication is about 1982. Immediately after they have um, invented this microscope, one of the surface that they have uh, 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 looked at was actually the silicon 111 surface. And not just the normal silicon 111 surface, because by now you know that silicon 111 surface is actually getting 
something called a very stable reconstruction known as the 7 by 7 reconstruction. So, the 7 by 7 reconstruction was for the first time ever resolved in space. Yeah? So, you remember this image that we have already looked at it uh, and these are basically the add atoms that we have already looked at it and that was actually just giving rise to this kind of nice 7 by 7 a supercell. Of course, the image at 1982 is not as flashy as the one we have seen uh, uh, in our previous lecture, but you can see this is the first image and then what was actually just um, interesting is that this was actually an unsettled question for about 20 years in cell for science, but just with the help of scanning tunneling microscopy, you can see the uh, name of the paper itself was like resolved um, the silicon, super, uh, silicon 111 reconstruction in real space. Yeah. So, then immediately after this, there were several images were taken on different surfaces, reconstruction of surfaces which was unsolved. All those things were immediately done and then people realized that this is actually one of the greatest discovery of um, that time and, and then was given the Nobel Prize uh, in physics. Well, the same people were also involved in the discovery of atomic force microscopy by the way. So, that is also uh, the, the important aspect of, of these people. So, you can see these are the people who finally uh, invented together with the few other um, uh, people like Gerber and Weibel uh, and, and so on. Well, just uh, uh, an important thing that I also want to show here is actually a little bit of the technical aspect. So, now um, you need to actually also just consider now the point is like one of the most important technicalities is that I need to also move the tip very systematically on the surface, but the movement of the tip should also be at the atomic scale. Yeah, but normally no mechanical device could achieve this, but then one can actually use something called a piezo scanner where a piezo ceramic material is used as the scanner material and piezo material is something you might be knowing that is actually a material which can actually respond if you apply a, a bias so that you can basically deform them by applying a bias and the changes the deformation that happens to this kind of material is in the order of angstroms or nanometer and therefore by carefully applying the voltage you can basically do the so called uh, scanning of the uh, of the small dimension because you have seen in the images what we are looking at is only a few nanometer by few nanometer dimension. So, this is quite a small dimension. Now, that is the most important thing a PSO ceramic scanner and the tip is always placed at the PSO ceramic scanner and then you have the sample. So, you apply of course, a bias between the sample and the tip and that is what you, you see here. So, you apply a bias between them and now the most important thing is when you measure. So, you apply a bias. So, you basically place your tip on top of the surface and then you apply a bias, you measure the tunneling current. But when you measure the tunneling current, you always maintain something called a feedback. The reason is simple because if the surface is actually more corrugated, let us say having some kind of topography and if you move the tip across the surface, the tip need to respond also to the surface. So, that means immediately when the tip see that there is a small protrusion on the surface, it will measure a very high current, then the tip should also get slowly retracted backward, otherwise the tip will just get bump into those protrusions. Therefore, a feedback mechanism should always work between the scanner and the, the tunneling current measurement and that is why you would always find that there is something called a feedback loop system is actually working and that is maintained by something called a set current. So, you measure or you uh, set a certain value for the current and that value of current will always be maintained while you do the scanning. Yeah. Um, that is uh, quite important, otherwise you would basically be ending up kind of um, crashing the tip into the, into the sample. So, that is why the Z scan is always, so the Z value is basically always been used back in the, uh, in the scanner, but X and Y are independent, the X scan, so the X vo voltage that you apply on the PSO and the Y voltage that you apply on the PSO are independent, but the Z is always been uh, um, connected to the so called feedback system, so that you can basically retract or move the tip up and, and down. Yeah? Uh, that is uh, uh, quite important. So, that is the, the, the a little bit of the technical uh, 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 factors for that. And then there are also some most important factors that are actually controlling the uh, 
um, the resolution of the of the tip, um, uh, resolution of the imaging. That is uh, most important is the stability of the instrument during the scanning. Yeah, you might obviously think about it because you know that you are actually just looking at atoms, and imagine that your tip is actually oscillating at a frequency which is in the order of a millimeter or something. You will never ever see an atom, right? So therefore, it is important that you need to have a tip which is um, uh, very well stabilized so that uh, the, the, the imaging is very stable. So how do you do that? You need to basically cut all the vibrations because if the microscope is actually sitting somewhere, the vibrations that happens around, for example, you cannot walk around the microscope. This is uh, something very interesting because if you walk around the vibrations, you would basically excite the floor and that excitation can actually couple to the microscope and then the microscope would also start to, to vibrate. That means eventually the tip will vibrate. If the tip vibrate, you cannot resolve the atom. So therefore, it is quite important that you cut the vibrations of the surface and therefore normally these microscopes are kept on some kind of a vibration damping tables yeah, or vibration isolation tables. Then all the acoustics, uh, that means you cannot also talk in front of the microscope because your voice would also basically couple uh, to the to the tip and the tip can actually just uh, get excited depending on on what you speak for example so therefore it is extremely important that you need to have a quiet vibration free ambience yeah then also like electronic noise should also be minimized Therefore, normally these kind of microscopes are kept uh, in, in the ground floor or in cellars where you have uh, to have a vibration damping table and also the acoustics of the room should also be maintained so that the um, uh, microscope itself is very stable in terms of the, um, 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 in, in terms of the vibrational acoustic um, uh, kind of noise that can couple to the microscope. Well, that's also something you can see here. This is actually like kind of a multi-stage damping. That's also something very routinely people use that this is actually the microscope itself. You can see where the tip, yeah. So this is the tip and this is the sample. So here it's actually a graphite sample. So you have a sample and a tip and the whole assembly, this is the whole assembly. So as you see here, the whole assembly is basically kept on something like a, a multiple stage damping so that um, each of these uh, feet would basically be connected by some kind of a rubber uh, pieces so that um, when there is a vibration at the lower floor, it will just get damped while it actually come closer to the STM. So that's uh, quite important. Uh, then you need to have uh, most of the time atomically flat surfaces. So you cannot imagine like using STM on an extremely a rough surface having some kind of um, nanometer or ten uh, more than 10 nanometer roughness. So this is quite difficult to work uh, with um, scanning tunneling microscopy. Um, therefore, like most of the time you will find that the STM images are always taken on, on flat surfaces. Yeah. So this is quite a requirement. Then the most uh, important thing is actually the radius of the probe. Yeah. Imagine that you want to resolve atoms that are spaced like that. If I would use a tip which is much, much, much bigger than that of the spacing between the atoms, you cannot resolve it. It's very obvious. Therefore, the sharpness of the tip should also be typically in the order of the radius, um, in the order of the spacing between the um, atoms on the surface. Yeah? So therefore, it is quite important that you need to make an atomically sharp tip or nearly atomically sharp tip. Well, that's surprising how you do that. Well, this is actually something called an electrochemically etched tip. So this is using an electrochemistry. You can basically etch materials out of a small wire. So the wires are typically just in the order of a, a quarter of a of millimeter wide, but you can still remove the materials and then you can get extremely sharp tip. Yeah. Or you can even take a wire and then by just using a mechanical cutting, you can also make uh, um, atomically sharp tips. So that's surprising, but you can basically do that. Uh, then the, the sample and the tip at low temperature is like not an absolute requirement, but if you can have the sample and tip at low temperature inside an ultra high vacuum chamber, 
then you can basically get super resolution. That means you can see sometimes not just that a molecule is sitting on the surface, you can see what is inside the molecule. That means even the atoms inside the molecules and so on you can see. Yeah? Uh, we will look at a, a few images to, to understand this in greater detail, but this is actually kind of a, an additional requirement, not the most important requirement, but as you see these are quite the most important requirement, the stability, the atomically flat surfaces, radius of the probe and these are extremely important and but with the, with the low temperature facility you can go to a better resolution because low temperature already um, 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 cools down the, the entire system and therefore like all the thermal noise can also be avoided in the, um, in the low temperature system. So that is the um, interesting aspect about it and with this you can basic, basically start working and uh, making images of atomically uh, resolved um, uh, in atomic resolution. Yeah? So in the next class what we are going to do is we are going to basically just understand what really STM measures and uh, what is the origin of this contrast that you see um, and then we will start to apply that to, to different type of materials. Yeah? Thank you very much for your attention.